and uh, she struck at me, and I dodged it. And as she was going back to recoil for another strike, she only went back about halfway and came at me with another quick strike that I wasn't expecting. Got me on my arm, um, punctured down into like two, I'm looking at my arm now, the scars, two or three different veins. Um, I don't know if she hit a main artery or not. I don't think she did. But uh, when I first looked down, I thought she did because I just see blood squirting out of my arm. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. You guys getting ready for some weather down there? Well, with the whole tropical storm and all that? Yeah. Um, nope, not really. Yeah. I, I, you know, we might get a little bit, we're not really preparing, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the media pumps this stuff up so much and it's like, it's just part of your year and weather down there. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, when it starts getting category three, four five, you know, we can start to worry a little bit, but other than that, it's not usually not too big of a deal. So we're coming up on September and for us out West, that that's kind of the beginning of our hunting seasons for you. You know, you're working year round on, on trapping your, you're doing all this, uh, all this stuff on these invasive species, you know, what's going on this time of year for you. It seems like you're focusing on hogs quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's actually usually not the case. Usually this time of year I'm hitting the Python super hard. Um, just because this is when they're the most active it's hatching season. So we got all the nest hatching, all the big females coming off their nest, looking for, you know, their first meal in a couple months and all the males are recuperated from breeding season. So all the snakes are out and about hunting, and that's when you, you know, you usually most successful is hunting them at night while they're hunting. But um, right now, the hogs have been just tearing up a couple of these contracts I have. And I just really haven't had the time to get down there and hunt the pythons. Plus, we, uh, the district and FWC just hired like 50 or maybe even 75 more python hunters. So, there's a lot of people python hunting right now. The levees are kind of clogged up with these new hunters. And uh, once they burn out a little bit, I'll be back down there hitting it hard probably. Gotcha. So how long have you been in the python game? I've really only been hunting these pythons this last four or five years, really. Um, you know, kind of as these uh, state programs started to get going. Before that, I, I was kind of skeptical of it. You know what I mean? Um, we don't really have them up here where, where I'm at. And uh, e- even when I would go down there hunting or working out in the Everglades, I wouldn't see them. And that's because I wasn't really specifically looking for them. Um, you know, I wasn't really out there all night cruising the levees with these high powered lights like I am now. But as soon as I started to do that, when I got hired on with the program, Um, and you know, they started to hold these different contests and everything. And I started to see these other people catching them. I really started to hit it hard at night and I was blown away with all the pythons I was producing. Uh, actually me and Allie, we, we started hunting it together and, uh, you know, we started hunting them like hogs or deer hunting them on foot all day long in the thick vegetation, the thick swamp where you would think they would be, where you think you would find them. And we were just killing ourselves and not producing many pythons. As soon as we started to cruise these levees at night, that stretch, you know, 20, 30 miles out in the middle of the Everglades and just sticking to the levee, driving them up and down, covering as much ground as we can. That's when we really started to produce the numbers and realize like, holy cow, this is, this is a big problem. This is why all of our native wildlife is missing. And you genuinely care about the native wildlife and, and are pretty hard on these invasive non-native species. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I've seen the de- 
through the decline, you know, used to go out in the Everglades and there'd be herds of deer, tons of raccoon, otters, marsh rabbits, you know, the, even just driving the highways that bordered the Everglades, they would be lined with marsh rabbits, you know, as you're driving. And now there's, there's just nothing. The only thing you see is roadkill pythons. So, um, you know, in this, especially in this last five years, it's really, the Python numbers are out of control. It's, it's insane. I think, um, you know, we are getting somewhat of a handle on it. Uh, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's more going to be managing these large pythons because we've definitely hit the large pythons hard. On average, we're catching a lot smaller and the smaller pythons do less damage, obviously. You know what I mean? They eat less. They're eating smaller prey. Generally, they're just eating the rats. So, um, you know, us taking out these large pythons, I've definitely seen a big boost in the native wildlife. I'm seeing marsh rabbits again. I'm seeing raccoons. I'm seeing otters. Whereas before, I didn't see any. Uh, the first two to three years, I was out there for the program hunting with, with my keys out in these areas I don't normally have access to. I was not seeing any wildlife. And now we're starting to see it come back. But like I was saying, we're definitely catching more pythons now than ever they're just smaller so it's it's going to be something we're always going to have to manage always going to have to stay on top of and uh it'll definitely always be an issue well will a big python lay more eggs i mean that's kind of a stupid question but yeah what's the difference it's it's a good question for sure and that and that's why specifically the females get so large the males they only get about 12 foot the females they're the ones that reach 18 foot and bigger because so they can lay these large clutches. Um, you know, an 18 foot snake, it, they could lay a hundred eggs or more. Dude, you've been desensitized. If you're saying only 12 feet, like if I saw a 12 foot (laughs) snake, that would be the worst part of my day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, on, so the first year I started, dude, on average, I was catching 12 foot or bigger. Like it, I was blown away. I was like, really? there are monsters in these swamps. Yeah, it was wild. And I was catching a, a ton of them, you know? Um, now we're, we're definitely catching a lot again. It seems like this hatching season um, is just on fire, you know, catching four to five, six, seven a night, but they're definitely smaller. They're all like six foot right now. It's like the, the larger side of average is eight foot. So um you know, we're, we're working the size down, but yeah, you know, to me, an average size Python is going to be anywhere from eight to 12 feet. And that's definitely a large, a large animal. How old are they to get that big? Surprisingly pretty young. Um, in a year they can reach six foot in two years, they can reach over eight foot. Um, that, that 17, seven inch I caught is probably five to 10 years old, depending on how much it's eaten. So, um, you know, it, it, it it's shows you how big of a problem they can become, how quickly. Okay. I want to talk about that snake and I'm going to link the video um, on your YouTube. But for those who haven't seen it, you caught an absolute giant snake this year, but it didn't go down as planned. Like just run me, run me through it. Tell me the story of this bruiser of a snake. So, um, for, for this whole year, maybe even, uh, I've been hunting these tree islands out on my little John boat, you know, trying to find nest and trying to, I really, what I was trying to find was a monster Python. I was calling it, you know, I'm searching for the man eater and, uh, I found a nest, which is really cool. It was the first nest for the Python program and, uh, first nest I've ever found a Python nest. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've caught a, some pythons breeding and everything like that, which by the way, all the videos are on my YouTube. And then, uh, so I go down this day to try my luck again, see what I find out on these islands, little 14 foot John boat. And, uh, maybe on like my ninth or 10th Island of the day, I come across the man eater, a monster, you know, I I couldn't tell how big it was just because of how big it was, you know, it just stretched throughout the vegetation further than I could really see. And, uh, I could just see its tail kind of slowly cruising and I could just tell it was an absolute monster. So I started videotaping it. I'm like walking up it, trying to gauge how big it is, trying to see where its head is. Cause on these real big ones, ideally 
you want to try to find the head and go right for the head. Um, because if you grab it by the tail, they're solid muscle. You know, they could be 100 pounds, 150 pounds, and 100%, especially with the vegetation that they can use as leverage. They'll overpower you, drag you out in the swamp, and you'll never be able to stop them. Um, so, you know, I'm looking for the head and, and I find the head, but I say, screw it. Let me grab this thing by the tail, fight with it. Um, my plan was, you know, cause I knew it was going to drag me out in the swamp. My plan was to really try to piss it off and get it to come and like attack me basically. So it wouldn't drag me off and I could kind of fight it how I normally fight the pythons, which is kind of dancing around it and waiting for my shot to grab the head. Um, I've caught them straight by the head before, but I've never caught a 16 foot plus this way. So, you know, Hey, let's see what I'm capable of. Um, grab it by the tail. It immediately overpowers me, starts pulling me in the vegetation, pull me in the swamp. And, uh, I'm able to kind of dig my heels into the limestone and just lean back and stop it. So we're both kind of at a tug of war. It's not gaining on me. I'm definitely not gaining on it. And uh, I get it to come back on me and it starts trying to strike at me. I'm dodging its strikes and uh, being as old and clever and smart as she is, she struck at me and I dodged it. And as she was going back to recoil for another strike, she only went back about halfway and came at me with another quick strike that I wasn't expecting. Got me on my arm, um, punctured down into like, Two, I'm looking at my arm now, the scars, two or three different veins. Um, I don't know if she hit a main artery or not. I don't think she did. But uh, when I first looked down, I thought she did because I just see blood squirting out of my arm. Um, You know, I got it all in video and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be an epic video. (laughs) My whole arm's just covered. At your funeral. (laughs) Oh, yeah, just dripping everywhere. Um, And, you know. My my main thought when I see all that blood spraying is like, I got to stop this bleeding. I got to first control her and then control this bleeding because not so much I'm worried about bleeding out all the way. I mean, that definitely crossed my mind, but I was more concerned about being out in this hundred degree sun, exhausted already, and then having to drag this snake, this 150 pound snake back to the boat. I'm going to black the fuck out. She's going to wrap me up and kill me. So, um, you know, I get her controlled. I'm kind of pacing myself, controlling my my breathing, trying not to use that arm because every time I squeeze or fight with her, blood's just spraying. Um, So I finally get her contained. I grab the snake bag that I have on my belt, pull it out, tie it around my arm as I'm fighting with her. She's trying to bite me as I'm doing it. Get my arm tied off. And then now is the really hard part having to drag her she actually weighed 135 pounds um 135 pound body all the way back to my john boat and uh i was able to successfully do it she was still alive got her to my boat uh stuffed her in a big black toad i had in case i did catch a monster and um on my on my boat was where my gun was so kind of caught my breath you know regained my energy and um opened it up grabbed her by her head and, and shot her. And then, uh, you know, fr- from there, got her out of the swamp, took her to my house, uh, skinned her out and everything like that. After I did weigh her and measure her with the state, uh, and she did end up being a record breaker, 17 foot, seven inches, 135 pounds. Absolutely unreal. So a, a snake like that, it can kill and eat a deer. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we call them, deer eaters. They, um, you know, at that size, they can eat just about anything. And probably what they're eating more than anything right now after, you know, our deer population has really plummeted is uh, alligators. They're probably feeding on like five to six foot alligators. Uh, I personally have come across and was able to rescue three alligators from pythons. Um, And it's a crazy thing to come across. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's Jurassic Park. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's it's such a different environment and that's kind of what I what I try to remind myself when I'm looking at your videos of you doing this this wild ass stuff, but it's where you live and and it's what you do. And I imagine that if you came out here and, you know, you're having to deal with with grizzlies and 
you know, the, the various predators that, that we have out here, it, it might be a little bit unsettling for you, but you know, you're, you're a courageous guy. You'd figure it out for me. I don't know if I've got the guts to get out there with a 17 and a half foot snake. Well, yeah. And, you know, you made a good point. It's all kind of, you know, what you're used to and your comfort zone. Um, I grew up with reptiles and snakes and, uh, you know, having them as pets and everything like that. So it's always been something I've been comfortable with and even alligators. But um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm not a big bear guy. I don't know. I know we got black bears down here I'm familiar with, but that's a very big difference from a grizzly. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's... um, it's kind of what, what you're used to, what you're comfortable with. And I feel like, you know, what you're knowledgeable in as well. Yeah. Um, and like we were talking about the storms earlier, I mean, people look at the the wind and rain from a tropical storm or hurricane. And if you live in the West, like that, that'd be a bad deal for us. We wouldn't know how to handle that. But if we get a weather forecast that we're going to get a couple of feet of snow, that's no big deal. If you got a couple of feet of snow in Florida, it would stop the show. For sure. I'd have a whole emergency out here on the ranch. <laughs> uh, so in iguanas, I want to talk about iguanas because I was supposed to go on an, an air rifle iguana hunt um, with one of the companies that I work with uh, this spring. And, you know, due to COVID, like it got canceled along with a lot of other things, that but, uh, that's something that, that you deal with quite a lot too, is the iguanas. Yeah. The iguanas keep me very busy. Um, you know, and right now, even the, the iguanas has kind of been my bread and butter. It's, uh, a lot of people are having problems with them and, uh, you know, they're usually, uh, high dollar places, big communities and, you know, they have budgets. And a lot of, a lot of the jobs I have, it's people don't have budgets. So it's kind of, I'm usually end up doing stuff for free or for, you know, barely anything and trying to make money off the skins and the meat on the back end, which never turns out too well for me. So, um, yeah, the iguana has been good for my pockets and, uh, it's, it's been devastating to see really is. Just Davie alone, just one city uh, this year spent $1.7 million on repairing damages from their boroughs on the levees. And, uh, you know, it's it's even reaching out into the wildlife and the ecosystem, the damage they're doing. Uh, I've been out hunting them and sat there and kind of watched them, uh, you know, kind of observing them and seeing them go down into other animals' burrows, destroy the nest, and totally take over the burrow, displace the wildlife. And usually it's to gopher tortoises or burrowing owls, and both of those species are threatened. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely not a good thing. And uh, they, they can be even quite aggressive and drive the, the wildlife out of their native habitats. A lot of these golf courses are seeing it, and... Uh, they, they cause big damage with the burrows they dig. They go in, undermine sidewalks, seawalls, uh, roadways, housing foundations, you know, basically you name it. And um, it, it, it costs big money, you know what I mean? So it's something that we're, again, always going to be dealing with unless we have a really good cold front, unless we get two feet of snow, like you say, and uh, kill off a bunch of them. But I don't see that happening anytime soon, so... For now, it's going to be air rifles and uh, using my dog Otto to take them out. <laughs> what kind of dog is Otto? Uh, he's he's a both his parents are draw hearts, but uh, he's not registered under the German system, so he he's a German wired hair right. corner. Gotcha. Yeah those those draughts are pretty incredible dogs. They can sure, they can do yeah. a lot of jobs. Absolutely. Uh, and you've you've got a pile of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're up to 15 right now with the three new puppies we got from uh, Allie's dad, Go-Kart Ricky. Uh, getting some of his blood <laughs> on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, real hopeful about them. They should be really good. Uh, they come from one of his, his best dogs and then his catch dogs. So should have a little bit of best of both worlds in there. Do you run any uh, black mouth curs? Oh yeah. Uh, that's what my lead dog is moose. Uh, he's all black mouth cur and uh, a couple of my other dogs are as well. And then I got Catahoula um, and um, a Ladner cur, but uh, mainly I like my curs. Yeah. Yeah. 
We see them up here a little bit. Some guys will run curs for lions and people will mix curs in with some of the other stock dog breeds, especially for getting cattle out of the brush and things like that. But uh, no, there's, they're a neat dog. I had a black mouth cur when I was in college and he was, he was such a cool dog. I missed the heck out of him. Yeah, they're great because they're kind of, you know, best of both. They can be a nice family dog companion. You know, you can take it around. I take them with me, you know, on every job basically. And, uh, but at the same time, they can go catch a hog if you need them to. What are some of the other invasive species that you work on? Um, we got, you know, I kind of have a little bit of hand in everything we have and we, we have a whole bunch, you know, everything from failed chameleons to different monitors, Nile monitor. I just caught a white throat monitor, uh, Mexican spiny tail iguanas, green iguanas, um, all kind of different invasive fish, freshwater, saltwater with the lionfish, the invasive Oscars, tilapia. Um, what else do we got? Uh, the, the feral hogs. Um, we even have some invasive deer species. Those usually aren't too much of an issue though. They're just, you know, kind of neat to hunt. Um, and you know, we, uh, we even have hell, we got monkeys and all kinds of different stuff. <laughs> I, uh, I haven't had too many monkey jobs, but, uh, I'm sure they're in my near future. <laughs> don't get bit. All right. I don't want to see you getting bit by a monkey. Well, yeah, definitely not. Cause supposedly the monkeys we got, I guess they have a strain of herpes. Oh, that would be so embarrassing. How do you even explain that for the rest of your life? Yeah. Yeah. I got monkeys from, or I got herpes from a monkey. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And uh, what's what, what's up with these Egyptian geese? How did they get there? Yeah. The Egyptian geese is another one. Um, And, you know, they got here basically the same way. Pet trade people having them on their property, thinking they'll stick around and they end up flying off and and making a new home somewhere else and mating. Um, They've really exploded this last five years. And uh, we're starting to see more of them and even the Muscovy ducks we have, which are also invasive. And, uh, you know, we even got peacocks now. I just took in a peacock rescue recently, actually. And uh, they are another invasive species we have down here breeding. So is there any hope for native wildlife in Florida? I mean, this sounds like an overwhelming just wave of of invasive species that are going to take over. Yeah, you know, the odds are definitely stacked against uh, the native wildlife, not only because of that, but just because of water quality and and how it's being managed and everything like that. You know, it's uh, and with all the development we're seeing is really the main the main problem. Plus, you add the invasive species on top of it. And it's just it's a lot, you know, but um, I think with you know, the awareness we're spreading, everyone's starting to get on the same page. I've seen in these last two, three years, a a huge difference in um, city organizations and and just the general public, you know, wanting to help and being accepting of of myself and other people killing these invasive species. Now they're no longer calling me a murderer or a sicko, you know what I mean? Because they didn't understand it. Um, so, you know, I think there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel and we're working towards it, but we got to continue at this pace. We got to keep, uh, figuring out new methods, keep coming up with new programs, getting the kids involved, more people involved. And, uh, I think it'll be where we can learn to live with them as we, you know, manage them, but it's going to be, you know, uh, always a thing for us. Well, you've got a, a big following on Instagram and and rightfully so because it's just some of the most entertaining stuff out there anytime that you deal with that though there's always going to be a lot of hate so how do you deal with that hate with those people that just want to throw shade and bring you know really bad negativity your way well um it's actually you know since i've started showing everything i have going on showing my intentions and explaining um i don't get it that much often anymore and it's been great um, here and there when I get a new follower on a post or someone that doesn't follow me, a quick comment saying, you know, what are you doing? Why are you killing these? You know, and, and they're upset or, you know, sometimes they don't even ask and they just assume the worst. I always try to take the time, um, almost always, and um, comment back or message them and explain why I'm doing this. You know what I mean? How I'm doing this and everything like that and explain a little bit about myself. And I've been very surprised at the response about how how most of these people will will 
be accepting and understanding and, and apologize and then start being some of my biggest followers. Um, now, there's always a handful of them that are just whacked out and they don't want to hear a thing you got to say. They'd rather just call you a murderer and, and you know, be an idiot. But, um, you know, I, I find more often than not, they they are understanding, which is which has been cool to see. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's good of you to take the time to help explain that. And just like you said, if somebody's willing to listen to the explanation and understand why you're doing it and that you're a reasonable person and that you're trying to help and that this is an effective way to help, you know, if they can hear that, man, you, you can turn that person into a really strong advocate. Exactly. Exactly. And that's uh, what I, what I've kind of realized. And I, I hope more, more people that, especially my buddies, you know, they're so quick to almost, they'd rather piss the person off. You know what I mean? And it's, you don't want to do that. You're just, you're making it tougher for yourself and for everybody else. So I'm hearing about gators getting farther and farther north and and their range sort of expanding. Is is that true or what's going on with the alligators? Are they doing all right? Are they getting eaten by pythons? Um, As far as expanding north, like what, out of state? Yeah, like I'm hearing about gators, you know, getting way up north in the Mississippi River Delta, you know, getting on towards Memphis and stuff like that. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Um, Yeah, you know, uh, we've the pythons are definitely eating the alligators, but the alligators are very successful at, at laying eggs and breeding and everything like that. Um, they're usually pretty good survivors. And, uh, with our state alligator program, we do an excellent job of managing the populations. So they're, they're doing great. They're doing better than they ever have super healthy, uh, great numbers and everything like that. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing them kind of starting to work their way up north more. Uh, maybe we need to start hitting them a little harder down here. <laughs> um, do you do any hunting for fun? Um, A little bit here and there. But, you know, since since I, I stay so busy with, you know, the conservation work and everything, I'm, I'm hunting basically every day. And if I do get some some time to myself, which is very rarely. Uh, I'm usually not going to go hunting, you know, but in, in my mind, you know, when I'm on these jobs working, dude, I, I feel like I'm hunting for fun for sure. You know, I'm having a blast. I'm, it's my passion. So I, it, technically I'd say I'm hunting for fun every day, just about. Yeah. I, f- I feel you there. I'll, I'll get you out West and get you elk hunting one of these days. I think you like that. Hunting. Heck yeah. Now something that, that I've been interested in just because it is so foreign to me is is alligator hunting but gator hunting in florida is a little bit different deal how does that actually play out for people who are recreationally hunting alligators there so um the there's a state alligator program which um it's basically a lottery and people apply for it and gator tags are issued depending on, you know, the state biologist decides how many for that area. And, uh, you have to harvest them using bang sticks. So you can't shoot them or anything. You can't trap them, nothing like that. And, uh, generally how it, how it's gone about is now this is on public land, private land. You can shoot them with a rifle, but, um, as, as far as what we're talking about, we'll stick to public land. Public land, uh, generally, you're going to be going out on these levees. Uh, they give you access to the area you have tags, or you, you can go out and boat depending on where you get the tag. And uh, you usually use a fishing pole with a big treble hook, and you cast it over the back of them. You snag hook them. You bring them up to you. Um, I like to get a second hook in them because usually you're not even in past the bar. Like you just barely have them. And you just need to keep tension on the line. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. So we get a second hook in them, uh, get them, get them up close to us and then hit them in the head with a bang stick, which I don't know if you're familiar with a bang stick. It's um, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's used in diving for fish where it's basically if you push it up against anything, it, it fires. Um, in this case, it would be a 44 mag for gators usually or, or a high um, big caliber bullet. And, you know. Usually you put, put two in them to make sure they're done, tape their mouth because you'd be surprised how tough they are. They can come back to life. And the last thing you want is a gator coming back to life. That's in your boat, bigger than your boat. <laughs> <laughs> that is the last thing that I'd want. 
or getting bit by a 17 and a half foot python. Those are about <laughs> neck and neck yeah. for me. <laughs> and then uh, is the meat good? On the gators? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the gator meat's delicious for sure. Um, it's very good. I I've never been a huge fan of it, but I do I do like it. You know, it's not something I'm I'm going crazy for. I usually try to sell most of mine and make a little dollar on it because people do like it, especially when it's fresh harvested like that. Um, I I never like gator gator meat from a restaurant, but then again, I don't like fish from a restaurant either. Um, it's good. You know, you just got to know what you're doing. Cause if you don't, it can be chewy and a little fishy, but, um, if, if it's done right, it's very, very good for sure. And the skin makes excellent leather. Oh, it does. Yeah. Pretty tough and thin. Um, no, it's, it's quite thick. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty good, strong stuff. Yeah. Okay. So when you're seeing it on, on boots or purses or stuff like that, they've ran it through a machine to thin it down a little bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you know, maybe they do a little bit, uh, you know what I mean? But as far as like compared to Python skins, it's, it's much thicker. Gotcha. And, uh, is that Python skin tough enough to be useful or is it just cool looking? Definitely useful. Um, even so I have some of my skins professionally tanned and then I have some of them more preserved where they keep their natural colors and it still looks like it's on the snake. And I make products out of both and they, and they both turn out great. I don't personally make the products. I have them made and then I sell them myself. But uh, yeah, the Python skin is awesome. Super strong, uh, super durable, and it's beautiful. Nice and soft and supple. And uh, when it's professionally tanned, it smells great. It smells like a baseball glove and uh, really turns out good. Like what, what kind of things are you making? Anything, anything and everything, uh, wallets, long wallets, card cases, bracelets, watch bands, earrings, necklaces, lighter cases, um, passport cases, you name it. Even uh, 1911 grips for pistols. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Where can people go to find stuff like that? You can go on my uh, website, Python Cowboy. They usually sell out almost instantly. So it helps if you follow my Instagram because I kind of announce it. Um, and I put them up there and once they're gone, they're off the site. I do right now, however, have, um, some items up there that have been sold already that I left up there to kind of give people an idea. They're mostly iguana products from iguana skins, but I'll be getting more Python stuff up there and, and people will be able to see it and buy it. Well, it sounds like you need to start charging some more money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So why aren't you carrying a pistol around with you, man? I that that just seems crazy to me that you're out there with these snakes that could just squeeze you to death like a old tube of toothpaste and then swallow you without, you know, thinking twice about it. I mean, I I feel like I would want a gun on me at all times. Well, um, you know, I'm not shooting any of them. I'm catching them all alive by hand. And uh, generally, I'm out there for like, you know, a week at a time. So I'm keeping them alive in a bag up until the moment I leave. And then I take them all out at once and shoot them all in the head. Um, but, you know, I used, I, to, see. I used to keep a pistol on my side, you know, just in case sort of thing. But it, it's just kind of a pain to keep on my side um, in and out of the truck all the time. And, you know, I got a suppressor on it, which I don't have to have on it. But um, and, you know, it's just it's easier for me to use a knife. I, I never use my pistol on my side. So, uh, the knife's just a little more lightweight, easier to tote around. And I, I honestly use it a lot more. So, uh, even with that big girl, if, if it went down, you know, South where I needed to, to do something, uh, I, I feel like I could make my knife work. You know, I, I usually keep two or three on me and they're easily accessible. Now I imagine given that this is your life and your profession, that this isn't the only time that things have kind of gotten Western on, on you. So can you think of any other stories at times that started to get a little bit intense? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's definitely, uh, there's been a good number of them, uh, you know, with animals and, and even with not animals, um, you know, uh, I'll give you one with, without an animal since I gave you one with an animal, uh, me and Allie were out, uh, hunting pythons out on the airboat. We were kind of cruising sunset time, um, trying to look for pythons coming out for, you know, the last little bit of daylight maybe, or, or starting to hunt for the night. And, uh, we start to get in some real thick sawgrass and, uh, start to get stuck a little bit. Cause 
I'm not in a real powerful airboat at the time. And, um, the sawgrass was just really overgrown, uh, you know, over taller than the airboat and it was just sticking to us. So I, I'm trying to get unstuck working the boat and actually working further out, trying to get unstuck, just burning through my gas. And, uh, wouldn't you know it, I get stuck trying to, you know, we're fully stuck. I'm in and out the boat, pushing it, moving it, wearing myself out, you know, drenched in sweat, starting to get dehydrated. Of course, we didn't really pack no waters or nothing. It was supposed to be a quick little trip and um, get unstuck. Finally, uh, hauling ass back to the trail and boom, I run out of gas. Now I'm super far out. You know, I burned through all my gas trying to get unstuck. And it is dark as hell. You know, it's like 10 o'clock at night now. And now we got to work our way out of the swamp on foot because we got no cell phone reception. Thank God I had my handheld GPS on us. Otherwise, we would have been totally screwed. Um, So I think it was six or seven, eight hours maybe took us to get out of the swamp um, through the thickest sawgrass I've ever been in, like to the point where I'm getting claustrophobic. And, uh, you know, I'm covered in blood because it literally slices you open as you're pushing through it. Totally dehydrated, both me and Allie, um, to the point where like in the last hour of, of our walk out, I'm like taking five steps and I got to stop taking five steps. And I got to stop for a little bit because I'm feeling like I'm back about to black out. She's about to black out. And if one of us blacks out, dude, we're, we're totally done. I can't carry her. She ain't going to be able to carry me. We're both just just done. You know, it's a hundred something degrees in this sawgrass and just sucks the life out of you. And um, thankfully, we we did get out. We did make it to the levee. But for me, it was just kind of a, a big eye opener, like, holy shit. You know what I mean? This this GPS probably just saved my life. No one would have found me out there. Um, I wasn't even worried about the alligators, the moccasins or anything like that. At that point, I was just worried about getting the hell out. I've never really felt so helpless in my life. You know what I mean? Just my life hanging on by a thread by this GPS. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it made me realize I got to sell my boat and get a more powerful one. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, throw in an extra jug of gas and, and a water. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Quick trips always end up the, the wrong way. So, uh, don't ever plan for a quick trip. Yeah, I just had a a guy message me this morning because I was talking about mountain lions the last couple of days, and he said that you know he always carries a pistol everywhere he goes in the woods, and he just wanted to go out and check a game camera. Um, it wasn't too far from his house, and he just hoofed it straight from his house to go check out this camera, and uh, had a lion come up on him, and you know it stopped at three yards and bounced off to the side and crouched down and no didn't want to leave. And it's like, yeah, those, those quick trips need, need respect. And it's like, yeah, carry a gun, man. (laughs) Hope hope you learned, but fortunately nothing, nothing bad happened there. Good, good. Yeah. But you know, definitely. These, uh, these airboats are pretty impressive machines. How many, what kind of engines they have? How much horsepower are you dealing with? Um, well, it all depends on the kind of boat you have. Uh, I have an aircraft motor boat, which they're usually a little bit, uh, cheaper and they're lighter, smaller. Um, it has the airplane motor still in it. You don't have as much power, um, as these car motor boats do. These car motor boats, they'll have a Corvette motor in it with a gear drive. And I mean, dude, they're getting like fucking 700, 800 horsepower. It's insane. And, um, what I have now, I, I have probably a, f- a few hundred horsepower, you know what I mean? The airplane motor, but the airplane motor is so light, you know, you can get by with that. The car motor boats, they're very heavy, um, usually a lot more expensive, but they go anywhere you want. But if you do get stuck, it's going to be a disaster getting out because you're very heavy. And if you got stuck, you're really, really stuck in that boat, you know? Oh, I bet. Um, so how much fuel are you burning? It's probably fairly efficient. Well, the, the airplane, um, it all depends on, you know, how much throttle you're giving it. If you're just kind of coasting all night, you know, you can definitely make it last. Um, if you're just trying to get unstuck and going balls to the wall, you're going to burn through it extremely fast. 
Um, the, the car motor boats are usually a little bit better with the fuel just because um, I feel like they sip it a little bit less. It's a lot easier to get it. You don't have to get airplane fuel. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, it, it, it just all kind of depends on how you're running it and how many people you got on the boat, how much weight, everything like that. So is there anything out there that, that does scare you? Because I mean, this, this stuff is, is terrifying to people. And I think that that's a lot of why they, they're watching what you're doing because you're overcoming something that, that they never could. Um, but like water moccasins, that's a, that's a bad deal and they can hide pretty well. I mean, they stink. So you kind of know that they're around, but yeah. what, what scares you out there in the swamp? Um, I, I don't know what really scares me. If I'm being honest with you, maybe, um, you know, there's definitely, um, certain species I respect more than others. Uh, I think would be maybe a better thing to say where I'm a little more careful with them, a little more uh, weary of them. Uh, surprisingly enough, raccoon is definitely one of them. Raccoons are, are fish yeah. little bastards if you're not careful, especially, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I've dealt with some rabid ones before and they are, they're no joke and they'll, uh, shit, a rabid, a rabid <laughs> raccoon will cost me 22 grand in rabies shots. So. It would have if a wow. uh, an, an anonymous donator uh, didn't cover my bill when I applied for uh, you know kind of a payment plan. They I guess they heard heard what happened. I saved someone's dog, and uh, they they covered the twenty two grand on my bill. But um, you know even after that, because I had to get it uh, boosted, I, I've gotten rabies like two or three times now, exposed to it, and uh, each time after that, it caught <laughs> no me. way. Man a grand to uh, get the booster shots. So, uh, yeah, dude, that's, uh, that's intense. I mean, rac- raccoons are no joke. We did wildlife rehab here on the ranch and had a, had a raccoon grow up here one time and, you know, it was all cute and cuddly when it was little, but the bigger it got, the harder that it liked to play. And it got to the point where I'd have to put on like welding gloves just to handle this <laughs> thing. It's like, this is too much. You know, you're, <laughs> you're playing rough. For sure. Yeah. They're no joke. I've, um, you know, an, another, another, um, uh, situation I've had down there that was a little bit dicey. Um, speaking of, you know, species I respect is, uh, I was down there with Allie and this is in the beginning of the program. We were out there camping out, out in a tent out in the middle of the Everglades. And this is after, you know, well, like I said, when we first started hunting it, like it was hogs or deer and we're just killing ourselves walking the swamp all day, you know, macheting down new trails and, and just sweating ourselves to death. Well, she wakes up in the middle of the night as we're sleeping in the tent, just locked up, you know, cramping bad, like dehydrated to the point where she's like crying, dude, like, you know, and, and she's, she ain't being quiet about it. Um, I'm trying to calm her down and kind of relax her, get her some Gatorade, stuff like that. Finally get her, you know, kind of uh, loosened up. She's she's not cramped up anymore and uh, starting to go back to bed. And next to my head outside the tent, I hear hear the most evilish, like the devil's whispering in my ear, just a growl. And, uh, it, you know, I found out, figured out later it was a panther. At first, I thought it was a big old gator just because of how deep and low it sounded. Um, I haven't, that was the first time I've ever had a panther growl at me. And, um, you know, I hear it on one side of the tent and then it's on the other side of the tent. Then it's back on my side of the tent. And, um, you know, we're like, holy shit, what, what's going on? I bust out of the tent with my shotgun and spotlight and we're in a pretty like open limestone patch and there's just nothing there, you know, nothing. We heard no footsteps in between or anything. And the only thing it could be is a panther. And, uh, I was blown away just by how this thing was able to, you know, from Allie's sound, um, you know, I'm sure it called it in. Oh, and we had a, a raccoon I recently rescued in the tent with us, a little baby raccoon that it could have been smelling. And, you know, it's crazy to think how probably how far we drew it away from to come find us. And then just how sneaky it was, was kind of like, damn, you know, this thing could be right behind you and you would never know. Yeah. How do you think that that Florida panther population is doing? It's, it's, almost we we have too many yeah 
Yeah. Um, and that's not going to be a real popular thing. You're not going to hear many people say that. Um, I catch a lot of, a lot of shit for saying that, but it's the truth. Um, the numbers are, are a lot lower than they really are. Uh, you know, there's reported like maybe 200 Panthers. I think they say there's way more than that. If that was true, then over a quarter of the Pan- Panther population dies every single year just for motor vehicles. That would be impossible. Um, and they definitely have a bigger range than they say. Um, we have them up in Martin County. We have them north of here for sure. Um, I, I've been a part of mo- uh, two different reports in Martin County. That was 100% a Panther. FWC, as soon as they got on the scene, they said it was a coyote. And anybody who knows anything about animals it would know it's not a coyote. Um, so, you know, it's... Uh, they do a lot in the name of the Panther. They, they protect a lot of land from development. So that's great. You know what I mean? But, um, we're having a lot of depredations down South on livestock and, uh, things like that. And 100% the cause of our deer population plummeting in the Everglades is from the Panthers. Um, the pythons play a role in that, but they're not the cause like everyone likes to say. The pythons eat all the small mammals, and because of that, the panthers prey directly on the large mammals like the deer and the hog. That's why there's absolutely no hogs out in the Everglades, and uh, the deer population is really struggling from mainly the panthers, but also the pythons eat some deer too. You know, every person that I've talked to that actually spends time out in the Everglades and, and out in the, the wild country in Florida tells me the same thing that you yep. just said. And I had a buddy who was running lions in New Mexico for a job and he'd worked on some Jaguar projects down in South America and he'd actually caught a Jaguar in Arizona as well. Oh, no kidding. But they, um, yeah, they contracted him to go over and, um, and collar a bunch of Panthers in Florida and when I asked him, I was like, that's got to be tough if there's only a handful of them left in the state. <laughs> and he, he said, you know, we, we, we caught Panthers every time we went out. Like there's lots and lots of them. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially Collier or Henry County. It's, it's insane. So here in Oregon, um, we used to run them with dogs and that got banned in the nineties and the population went way up and the deer population crashed. And now we're looking at a situation where mule deer, one of our native deer species, you know, is, is, you know, we've got half as many of them as what we did just a few years ago. And that was half of what we had a few years before that. So it's looking really ugly for the mule deer. Yeah. Um, but I think that when people look at a mountain lion or they look at a Florida Panther, they, they think that it's just a big house cat. Um, and a house, a feral cat is a, is a deadly animal in its own, but it is not your house cat. This is a different animal. Oh yeah. Big time, big time. And the Florida Panther itself is, it's just a mountain lion. You know what I mean? Especially now that they brought in the Texas Cougars to breed with the Florida Panther to revamp the population. The, the, you know, historic Florida Panther doesn't exist anymore. Um, but the historic or historic Florida Panther was just really a, uh, a mountain lion in the Everglades. Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing stuff, man. Um, if, if people want, want to support you and what they're in, what you're doing in, in protecting, you know, what remains of the native wildlife in Florida and down there in the Everglades, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, follow my Instagram. Um, I have merchandise on, on my website, pythoncowboy.com. That goes directly to my wildlife conservation or my, my wildlife rescue and my conservation efforts with invasive species. Um, and then watch my YouTube, you know, um, I, my YouTube's monetized. They pay me for people watching. So watch my videos and uh, yeah, spread the word. Well, that's, that's easy stuff for, for folks to do. And I highly recommend it because dude, those videos are awesome. And I know it's a lot of work for you to run those cameras and, and to wear a GoPro and, and try and get multiple angles when you're, when you're dealing with these dangerous animals in a dangerous situation. Um, and you're, you're doing that for the benefit of people to be able to see this and understand exactly what's going on down there. 
a hundred percent, man. And I appreciate that. And, and yeah, you're, you're right. It definitely, uh, it ain't easy, but, uh, it, it's been very rewarding and, you know, I've, I definitely love it. You know, I love people seeing it. I love seeing the reactions and interacting with, you know, everybody following along and, uh, just seeing the the difference in in the general public has been the biggest reward for me. I got all these kids that are interested coming out, seeing about invasive species at the different shows um, I do around the state, and you know it, it, it's very cool to see. Uh, social media has been has been great. Well, look, I want to get down there and and uh, spend a night getting the the pants scared off me with you one of these times, and I'd love to get you out west if you ever want to come out here. I'd, I'll help you in any way I can. For sure, man. I'd love to have you out. Let me know. We'll make it happen. Okay. Well, sounds good, Mike. And and thanks again so much for your time. Um, I'm going to link to everything in this podcast description so you guys can go follow Mike and uh, and learn more about what's going on there and then get yourself a, a Python wallet or something cool like that. Yeah, sounds yeah. pretty awesome to me. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Mike. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate being on. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. This episode was edited by Emily Brannigan, with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Artwork for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatterlin and digitized by Celia Christofferson. If you enjoyed the show, I encourage you to share it with a friend and subscribe. You can find photos and more content on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.